welcome you to online worship at Prairie Avenue Christian Church in Decatur, Illinois. Prairie Avenue Christian Church welcomes those who are single or married, divorced or engaged, gay or straight. We welcome the filthy rich, the dirt poor, or no habla ingles. We also welcome those who are crying newborns, old as dirt, skinny as a rail, or could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you are dressed to the nines or have only the shirt on your back. We welcome anyone who can sing like Stevie Wonder or who can't carry a tune in a single bucket. You are welcome here if you are just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. We don't care if you are holier than Swiss cheese or haven't been in church since your nephew's or niece's baptism in 2003. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, nose pickers, tax collectors, veterans, vegetarians, and junk food junkies. If you blew all your offering money at the gaming parlor, you are welcome here. If you are inked, pierced, or both, you are in the right place. If you are in recovery or still addicted, we are happy to see you. We welcome you because we have experienced the thrill of being welcomed by God. We were all once a mess, but God willingly welcomed us through the cross-stretched arms of Jesus. He gave his life so we could experience real life and be part of his forever family. God is truly delighted to see you here. And we at Prairie Avenue Christian Church are too. Welcome to worship today. Merciful and just God, we gather here, each of us with many concerns on our hearts. Our hearts are concerned with systems of injustice which strip people of their dignity and their very lives. Help us to be those who would seek peace with justice, who would fight for those who are oppressed, offer voices for the voiceless, and dignity for all humankind. Be with us today and guide our steps toward a more just world in your name. Amen.
10 rules. 10 rules of survival. 10 rules of survival if stopped by the police. Number one, be polite and respectful when stopped by the police. Be polite. Be respectful. Remember that your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. I'm sorry. Number two, if you feel your rights have been violated, you and your parents have a right to file a formal complaint with your local police jurisdiction. Number three, do not, under any circumstances, get in an argument with the police. Number four, always remember that anything you say or do can be used against you in court. Number five, keep your hands in plain sight. Make sure the police can see your hands at all times. Number six, avoid physical contact with police officers. Do not make any sudden movements and keep your hands out of your pockets. Number seven. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not run, even if you are afraid. Even if you are afraid. Number eight. Even if you believe you are innocent, do not resist arrest. Number nine. If you are arrested, do not make any statements about the incident until you are able to meet with a lawyer or public defense. Defender. Number 10, stay calm and remain in control. Watch your words. Watch your body language. Watch your emotions. Remember. Remember. Remember, your goal is to get home safely. Get home safely. Let us pray. 
To you, O God, be all glory, the one who visits us in three persons, the holy trinity of hope and love. For there is no place which is without you, O God, and no time where you are not there. For you are the beginning and the end, the source of all that is in the wonder of universal life. And yet you take us by the hand and lead us, as the life of Christ walks our human way and shows us that life is stronger than death. In the Holy Spirit, we are gifted again and again and are called onwards toward a future in which we are surrounded with love and grace. Hear our prayers for those of our world who do not realize the presence of your love in their lives. For those who are lonely or hurting, sick or oppressed, grieving or broken in spirit, we pray that by our lives we might bring into their presence an awareness of your love and your healing strength. As we seek your guidance to be the church you have called us to be, may the power of your spirit infuse us with the hope of fulfilling your will and of working with you to transform your world even as you transform our lives. May the peace that is ours in Christ Jesus be spread throughout this earth, and may your glory be shown by all that we do. For we praise and worship you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Indeed, there is no other God like you. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes to us from the first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, 4. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome a sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. I'm not sure which theological concept is more difficult to explain clearly, whether it's the humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ, where we believe that Jesus is 100% human as well as 100% divine, or this three-in-one combination of God that we commonly call Trinity. We use a Trinitarian formula every time we baptize someone. We baptize people in the name, under the authority, of the Father, the Son, and for King James versions, the Holy Ghost, but we commonly say the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is often described as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. St. Patrick, in the early Middle Ages of promoting Christianity to the pagan Druids, and according to legend, illustrated the Trinity by holding up a shamrock with three leaves to the population, describing how God is in three leaves 
yet drawn from one stem. The stained glass windows in our sanctuary in the upper right hand and left hand corners has a French symbol of the fleur de lis, a lily with three leaves, again reminding us of God's three in oneness. I have heard Trinity described as the three states of water. Water can be frozen, water can be a liquid, and water can also be steam or a gaseous vapor. Each of those times, it's still water, just in a different form. Same basics, but manifesting itself differently. I still struggle at how can someone be 100% human, 100% divine, and still not be 200% of anything and just one entity. As I also struggle with God is one and yet three, but is not three gods. It's God in three manifestations. This Sunday after Pentecost is always observed as Trinity Sunday. And we may be unable to explain it any better than through these symbols or metaphors, but it can help us as we begin this journey of our summer series of looking at family, because there's probably not a better presentation of the perfect family working perfectly than in the creation story. Our scripture reading today is probably the most read chapter of the Bible. Come on, admit to it. Whenever you say, I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover, you begin with Genesis 1-1. Unless that Bible happens to be a New Testament and Psalm version where you begin with Matthew 1. And our stamina starts to lag as we read chapter after chapter of Genesis and then Exodus. And finally, we probably stop all together when we get to the lurid descriptions of how to dress up your burnt offering and the priestly roles in the book of Leviticus. A really bad B-movie plot if ever there was one. And probably this phrase, among many others, is the most remembered biblical phrase. In the King James, it's rendered in the beginning. Now, the Hebrew is a little more nuanced than the King James gives us. The Hebrew reads, in a beginning, at a beginning time, or in a real sense, for Hebrew, it means once upon a time. In Hebrew poetry that's lost to us in stilted English translation, we get the scene after scene, day after day, of a glimpse of the eternal trinity. The Spirit of God is sweeping over the face of the waters, the void. The God that, that creates, that calls forth with commands, with his words, to bring forth everything from the lights in the sky, to the plants in the field, to the fish of the deep, to the birds of the sky. And then in the midst of all this creating and calling forth, there is this resounding agreement made. Let us make humankind in our likeness, in our image. 
let us, not let I, let me, let us make a mini person reflecting the very image of us, given similar authority through caretaking, through husbandry, through stewardship and management of this creation. Everything created is given for use to be good. What is also lost to us in this creation story says what the other popular creation stories do not say. These creation stories are not about hows, they're about whys. Creation is not drawn from the entrails of a defeated God, nor are humankind made to be serving the victorious gods. The Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Elish, tells the story of a watery void and two gods existing at that time, a freshwater god named Apsu and a saltwater goddess named Tiamat. And from the saltwater god and, goddess and the freshwater god came the younger gods. And of course, decided to rebel against mother god and father god. And through that eventual killing of the father god first, Apsu, and then defeating Tiamat, the mother goddess, through the victory of Marduk and the making of humankind was simply to do the work that gods did not have to do anymore. Creation is made simply for chaos control and unending servitude for humankind. The writers and editor of Genesis simply plagiarized the Babylonian creation story for their own purposes. And contrary to the Babylonian creation story, this God, this entity, this family of God is created for good not control. This family of God makes partners with creation rather than slaves for their own purposes. This process is a shared one, unique in celebrating light and life, not as rival gods, but as joyful declarations of love, as pure, eternal, and unconditional. The writer of the Gospel of John will later echo this call of Genesis of in the beginning with in the beginning was the word. This God now comes to us, the creator, the essence, the origin as a fellow human being, as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, contrary to popular interpretations, this story, this poetry, with its evening and morning rhyme, is not the how to create the earth in six days recipe. This is the first one of two stories, two versions of creation stories preserved to us in the book of Genesis. And it's neither a contradiction of science nor does it require faith. It is not answering the questions that science asks. It is answering theological questions. Now, science cannot answer these theological questions, nor does it challenge the existence of God. That, too, is out of the range of scientific discovery. The creation stories don't tell us how it's made. The creation stories remind us why 
it was made. Why it is the way it is. What did the gods do to make this space for us? And what is our role in that space created by these gods? The creation is this mutual joy and peace celebrated by that perfect family that establishes everything to reach towards that same joy, that same peace. This divine family joins in creation, in its sustaining, in its redeeming. And this same family of God invites and encourages the ever faithful, ever multiplying, and the ever goodness. Creation isn't to be the sanctuary of the slaves of the gods. Creation is enjoying creation and sharing it with co-creators. Sadly, and very quickly, as we'll find out, this perfect creation, this partnership, co-partnership, co-relationship will fall back into chaos that was once the source from which order came. Perfect life creates the first human family, and from that first family, we mess up. Not only the relationship between us and creation, but also between us and the Creator. And then, as usual, when something is messed up, the blame game, rather than responsibility and acceptance, begins, which guilt always makes blame fruitful and manifest. And from harvesting a fruit of guilt will come the other fruit that comes from messing up. Shame, which makes the first humans hide from the very Creator from God. And in hiding from God, they begin that path of wandering to be repeated over and over again throughout human history. Estrangement with the Creator as well as creation. And throughout human history, the God. The three in one, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer worked, is working, and will be working to bring the estranged human family back from its own exile, coming alongside on its journey, living among it, even being one of them all in the effort of recreating. The story of this family affair between the separations of sibling rivalries, moments of adultery, trickery, as well as betrayal, will also reveal not only the imperfection of that human family and the messy lives they tend to leave, but also the imperfections of our own human family and the messy lives we tend to have. But it also reveals to us that reconciling work of the three in one, never faltering in its pursuit of reconciling the world and its inhabitants. It is still one family with one 
divine purpose. With one relentless, relentless plan of creating, redeeming, and sustaining mutual joy and peace. Among our own imperfect families, in our own messy lives, God's plan of reunion is still at work. This work of recreating us into what God already sees us to be as children and co-creators, redeemers and sustainers is never ending. So as we gaze at the handiwork that is creation and find God's handiwork, not only in creatures, but also in ourselves, in others, in that same mutual joy and peace. And we can declare again, it is good. Amen. Out of your loving family, you called us forth and you declared all things created as good. You set us apart to serve not you alone, but to serve creation, to be fruitful and multiply. Our fruitfulness and our multiplication has often led us to multiply our failures and to complicate our relationship with you. Help us, Creator, to restore your creation as you would have it done. Help us, Redeemer, for us to discover that nothing is beyond redemption. No one is beyond your redemption. Help us, Sustaining One, to see your work done and to give us strength to see your presence still. And now, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be with us as we now work to do and your will to fulfill. Amen.
As the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, God created the world and called it good. God breathed life into humans, each made in God's image, and called them good as well. God so loved us, in fact, that when we failed to stay in communion with God, the Son was sent into the world so that all of us might find life abundant. As we give thanks today for the gift of life and for God's sustaining presence in it, we have the opportunity to offer up ourselves to God afresh and open our lives to the movement of God's Spirit among us so that we might be recreated to be what God has seen in us all along, truly good and signs of God's love for the whole world. Let us pray. Eternal three in one, you care for each one of us as if you had no one else to care for, and you care for all of us even as you care for each. We are here because you have invited us. We recognize at the deepest levels of our beings that it is by this table that we are affirmed and made whole. Enable us to know now the presence of the Christ, the one who calls us to be one family, the one in whose presence no one can be called a stranger. Forgive us that we have been hard of heart, that we have failed to acknowledge others as brothers and sisters. Enable us now to accept the fact that we are members of one another, that we are family with all of your creation, and that we are all loved by you. We pray these things in the name of the Christ, who has called us to you and has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
For those who are regular attenders and members of Prairie Avenue Christian Church, a quick reminder that your continued support of the work and the ministry of the church is important, even though we are not physically present today. You can use our donate page on our website. If you've never done it before, it's fairly straightforward to figure out. You can easily drop your offering in the mail. The church's address is 2201 East Prairie, Decatur, Illinois 62521. If you have any questions, you can call the church office at 217-428-3327. Thank you for your continued generosity. Go forth with empowered joy to work for and with ministries of peace with justice. Be the good stewards of the earth and its people that God has called you to be. Amen.